Christ. This is the Hour of Faith, originating from the sanctuary of the Faith Baptist Church of Altoona, Pennsylvania, 315 40th Street, in the Highland Park section of the city. As you participate in today's broadcast, may the Lord challenge your heart with the Word. Welcome those of you joining us by radio, television, World Wide Web, YouTube, Facebook, whatever it is that we are coming to you by. We do thank you so very, very much for the pleasure of your company as we gather together today on Resurrection Sunday 2018. I say to you, he is risen. He is risen indeed. And indeed he is. And because he is risen from the grave, we have eternal life and we have abundant life through faith in him. And I want to say to you today, as we are gathered together here, keep in mind that uh, Easter is much more than eggs and rabbits and little chickens and jelly beans. I mean, those might be nice things to eat, but when we think of Easter, we think of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He went to the cross nearly 2,000 years ago, and on that cross, he suffered and he bled and he died, and then he rose again on the third day to give eternal life to all who call upon the name of the Lord. Every Sunday morning, we commemorate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but certainly on what we call Easter Sunday morning, or here at Faith Baptist Church, Resurrection Sunday, we honor Christ in his resurrection. And it is our prayer that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. This morning, I was handed an article out of the Altoona Mirror, and uh, I was greatly concerned about it. The question on what they call the Sunday viewpoints was, during this holiday season, how do you gauge your commitment to religion? Well, first of all, religion isn't what it's all about. It's about Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people who are religious but lost. This day is not a day of religion. This day is a day in which we commemorate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we get the essence of the question. And there were four individuals asked, and if you get the Altoona Mirror, you have seen this. One fellow said, I'm not a very religious person. Another fellow said, I'm not really big on religion. I'm an atheist. Another young lady said, I know there's something there, but I don't practice any organized religion. And then the final one said, I don't believe in God. Now, Brandon, Adias, Samantha, and Angela. Those are the names of these people. You may be listening today. God in his sovereignty could have brought you into this message or into this service by radio, television, the World Wide Web. However, I want to remind you it's not all about religion. It's about Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Christ is real. Christ is a historical figure. But Jesus Christ is also the resurrected Lord, the King of kings, the God of gods, the Savior of all saviors who shed his blood and gave his body 
and bore in his body your sin and my sin, so that through faith in him we might have everlasting life. All that was necessary because the Bible says we've all sinned and have come short to the glory of God and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord and that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, which means to be delivered from sin, its power, its penalty, and its presence through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And so to Brandon and Adias and Samantha and Angela and anybody else out there today who does not recognize who Jesus Christ is, I remind you, he is your Savior. He died for you. He rose again for you. Will you receive him today? Simply call upon his name. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 4 that he was delivered for our offenses, that is our sins, and he rose again for our justification that is the forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus Christ. Call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Certainly if we can minister to you at all, spiritually speaking, please contact us. Those of you watching, you can see the contact information on the screen. I would invite you to give us a call if you have a prayer request. That's 814-944-2894. 814-944-2894. Or our website is www.fbcaltuna.org. That's www.fbcaltuna.org. Go to that website and you can see a whole lot of things that are taking place around the Faith Baptist Church as well as a way that you can send in the prayer request or get in touch with us and we would certainly encourage you to do that. Well, this is Resurrection Sunday. And, uh, you know, in our hymn book, there's a song entitled, Christ Arose. Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior. But he didn't stay there. He rose again triumphantly to give eternal life to all who call upon the name of the Lord. Hymn number 138 in our hymn books here in the church. Let's sing this song gloriously, Christ Arose, number 138, standing as we sing.
Phil McCauley. It was the third day since he died And it was said he would arise Then from the grave this lamb came forth Oh, I have reason to rejoice he chose the place he chose the hour that he would rise by his own power a sacrifice three days ago and now praise God, a lamb arose. There rose a lamb in Jerusalem. He was the son of the great I am. He proved to be my victory. Jerusalem in Jerusalem. I wasn't there when Jesus died. I wasn't there to see him rise. But I was there when he saved my soul. For within my heart this lamb arose. There rose a lamb in Jerusalem. He was the son of the great I am. He proved to be my victory. In Jerusalem, he arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose, he arose, he arose, hallelujah. Christ arose, he proved to be my victory. There rose a lamb in Jerusalem. Behold the Lamb of God who cometh to take away the sin of the world. I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is referred to as the resurrection chapter in the Bible, or at least that's what I refer to it as. I call it the resurrection chapter because it's all about the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of believers to follow. And uh, we all certainly appreciate this passage of Scripture, no doubt, and I want us to focus on it this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, and I invite you to stand out of respect for God's Word as I read and you follow along. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, where the Word of God says, 
Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Father, we thank you for your word, for it is true. Thank you for the opportunity that we had to read it today and study it. And I pray that as we consider the three great elements surrounding the cross in this passage of Scripture, that you will use it for your intended glory today. May your purpose be fulfilled, may souls be saved, Christians be edified, but above all, may you be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray, and all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Turning the calendar back by about 2,000 years, and according to the biblical timeline of Christ's life on earth, We are now nearing the end of Christ's time on the earth, as it were. But we are coming to the most significant part of his redemptive work. You see, Jesus Christ has spent 33 and a half years on the earth, and three of those years were in public ministry, during which time many rejected his message. Many were not sure about him, And there were a small number of people who believed upon him and followed him as their Lord and Savior. The ministry of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ was filled with divine theological teachings and great miraculous works that proved that he truly is the Son of God, that he truly is the Savior of the world, and that he truly is the Messiah the Jews had been long time awaiting and anticipating. During his triumphal entry into Jerusalem that we had the opportunity of studying last week, there were many who called upon Jesus to save them, and and they gave him praise as being the king from heaven. They shouted out, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Many recognized who he was. They said, glory to God in the highest. But as the week after that great event wore on, the Jewish leaders that had gathered in Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover led the charge to crucify Christ because, well, he was not the Messiah that that they wanted him to be. He was a Messiah that would be a spiritual Messiah. They wanted a political Messiah. They wanted somebody to save them not from hell, Not from sin, but from Rome. And so on the Thursday of that week, actually it would have been Thursday evening of that week and Friday morning, Jesus was falsely tried under Herod and Pilate. We all know the story. And he was sentenced to be beaten and crucified, which according to the prophetic scriptures was all a part of the plan of God to provide redemption for mankind. What Jesus went through during that time was was not a mistake. Oh, it was a mistake in the sense that many people did not recognize who he was. But it was a part of God's plan that was established even before the foundations of the earth. And so Jesus came into the world to go through that false trial, that mockery, to go through that suffering pre-cross to go through the cross and to suffer and bleed and die and resurrect again from the grave so that we might have eternal life. All of that was a part of God's plan to provide redemption for for mankind. 
For sure, now we all know the account of the, of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as it is brought out in the Gospels. We know that very well. We could probably all say at least a part of it if we had the opportunity to do so this morning. But today I want us to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that I often refer to as the resurrection chapter because in the first part of this chapter we have a very clear presentation of the effect of Christ's redemptive work. Therefore, on this Resurrection Sunday of 2018, we're going to take a look at the first part of this great chapter we're going to observe the three elements surrounding the cross that contributed to the effect of Christ's redemptive work. And we need to keep in mind that without each one of these elements that we're going to look at today, there would be no redemption. There would be no reason to praise God. There would be no reason to sing, Hallelujah, what a Savior, because He lives. Now, in the first four verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we see that the Apostle Paul is expressing the message that he received from the Lord Jesus Christ and the preaching that he declared to, to the believers there at Corinth. Uh, yes, indeed, when he began to proclaim that, they weren't believers. But we can see clearly here what he preached. And really what we see is the gospel in the nutshell. Take a look at those first few verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Verses 1 and 2, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Paul preached the gospel always, and may that be the very center of our message today, too. He says, Which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. Isn't it not, is it not true that it's in the gospel that we stand? It's in the gospel that we are saved. It's in the gospel that we have everlasting life. He says, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. And then he says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Now remember, that was a phrase that was very near and dear to the Apostle Paul's heart. Why? Because the book of Galatians chapter 1 teaches us that after Paul got saved, he went into the Arabian wilderness for three years. And the Lord Jesus taught him the message of the gospel. He did not learn it from anybody else, but the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And we say, when he says, for I deliver it unto you, first of all, that phrase means more importantly, that which I also received. He's talking about that which he received directly from Christ, which is the gospel. How the Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That is the gospel in a nutshell. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These are things that most of us here today are very familiar with. We know these elements. We talk about the death of Christ. We talk about the resurrection of Christ, but we don't often talk about the burial of Christ, do we? And yet it's been told that there is more description about the burial of Jesus Christ than anybody else written about in history. Now it's been told that. I'm not the one that came up with that statement. But it's been told that. And yet so many times when we talk about the work of Christ, we don't consider the burial. And yet it's all part of the plan of God that we want to look at today that resulted in our redemption. The three great elements surrounding the cross is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at these three elements today. First of all, we look at the death of Christ. And I, I, I remind you, even as we develop this a little further here today, that Jesus Christ died to pay the wage of our sin. Amen? Amen. The Bible says we've all sinned and have come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus died for us. He became sin for us. He paid the wage of sin for you and for me. His death is very significant. 
Now, when we look at this passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 15, where he says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That little phrase, according to the Scriptures, shows that Christ's death was all a part of the plan of God. It had to happen. Jesus had to die. And he did. That's a historical fact. So let's consider the death of Christ a little bit. First of all, we find that as we study the scripture, that Christ's death was predicted. We're not going to take the time to look at all of the predictions of of the, the death of Christ that's in the scripture, but they are many. Back in the Old Testament, in Psalm 16, in Psalm 22, and in Isaiah chapter 53, it teaches us very clearly that the Messiah would come into the world and he would die for the people of the world. Now, the Jewish people that were responsible, as it were, right there in Jerusalem on the day of his crucifixion, who said, crucify him, crucify him, those people had no excuse for not recognizing Jesus as the Messiah. They should not have been at all surprised at Christ and what he taught and his death, because over and over and over again, it was predicted in the Holy Writ of the Old Testament Scriptures. But not only was the death of Christ predicted in the Old Testament, it was predicted numerous times in the New Testament. We, we looked at one of those passages last week as we talked about the triumphal entry when the Lord Jesus Christ himself very, very clearly brought forth words about his own death and resurrection when he said in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21, it says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. And so, as we look at the death of Christ, it wasn't anything that should have been unexpected because it was predicted by the prophets and even by Christ himself. Christ's death was predicted, but also Christ's death was purposed. It was purposed in the heart of God. Not an accident, not a mistake, not an oops, as we would say, but it was something that indeed God purposed. Turn with me, if you would, please, to Acts chapter 2. In the second chapter of the book of the Acts, we find that Jesus Christ had already ascended into heaven. And Peter and the disciples were there in Jerusalem, and, and Peter preached this great Message after which 3,000 people got saved. And notice, beginning with verse 21 in Peter's great sermon of Acts chapter 2, he says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then he gets to the heart of it. He says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. They could not deny these these, uh, works of Christ. They could not deny his miracles, his his wonders, his, his many signs. They saw it. They knew it. They observed it. They couldn't deny that. Peter was saying these were of God. Then he went on and he said, look at this in verse 23, him, Christ, being delivered by the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. But look, if you would please, At verse 23, it says there that the death of Christ was purposed. Wow, how and why? Well, simply because it says he was delivered by the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God. The fact that Jesus died was God's plan. The place where Jesus died was God's plan. The cross upon which Jesus died was God's plan. Those who would be around that cross and who nailed those those spikes into his wrists 
and into his ankles and to thrust the sword into his side and to put that crown of thorns on his head. All that was planned by God. And when you put together that phrase, the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God, you've got certainty, you've got assurance, you've got power. And it was through that power and that purpose that Jesus Christ went through the cross, went through the cross. It was a perfect plan, purposed and fulfilled by God. Need I remind us that nobody could have taken Christ's life apart from his willingness to give it? It was planned by God. The death of Christ was predicted. The death of Christ was purposed. Thirdly, the death of Christ was performed. We see that again right here in verse 23, where it says, as Peter is speaking about Christ, him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, have ye taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Yes, Christ's death was performed as the result of a twofold connection. Number one, it was performed by divine deliverance. It's God the Father who took Jesus Christ to the cross. You know that, don't you? It's God the Father who performed the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. It's God the Son, Jesus Christ, who said, yes, I will go to the cross. Every now and then you'll hear people say, who killed Jesus? Well, here's the answer to that. The Father planned it. The Son performed it. But then, it says here that he was killed by dirty hands. You see that there in verse 23. Ye have taken him by wicked hands and crucified and slayed him. That word wicked talks about the idea of that which is spiritually dirty. Yeah, we see that that God in his plan used the Roman soldiers to nail Christ on that cross and to lift him up. And I, I think of that so often, that there Jesus Christ, they, they undoubtedly had, had the cross laying out there on the ground and, and, and they put him on that cross and they nailed his wrists to the cross beams and they nailed his, his, his ankles to the, to the upright and then they lifted that cross up by a rope and a thud. It fell into a pre-dug hole. All the joints and the muscles and the flesh of Christ ripping for you and for me. And then in his body he bore our sin that through faith in him we might have life. And so you see, Christ's death was performed. Yes, it was God the Father through divine deliverance that put him there. It was God the Son through divine deliverance that enabled the cross to become a reality. But it was the dirty hands, the wicked hands of those unbelievers, the old wicked Roman soldiers who put him there. But I remind each and every one of us that Jesus Christ himself offered himself for us. And so when we ask the question, who killed Jesus? It was God who worked it all out, but it was for you he died. It was for me he died. The Bible tells us he died for the sins of who? The whole world. And so the death of Christ indeed was predicted. It was purposed. It was performed, but finally Christ's death was personified. I think that great teaching over in the book of of, of Romans chapter 5, this is a a classic passage of Scripture as it relates to our salvation and for what Jesus Christ did for us. In Romans chapter 5, in verses 6 through 8, we see these words where it says, For when we were yet without strength, that is spiritual strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's us. For scarcely for a righteous man... Will one die? Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth or demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Christ died for the ungodly. That's how personal sin, or the cross was. Christ died for the ungodly, the people of the ungodly, because we were sinners. But then Christ also is the one who died for us. His death was very personal. 
there's a teaching out there in the false religion that the death of Jesus Christ appeared to be real. It was real. Because Jesus Christ really, as a person, died for you and me as the people who needed it. Thank the Lord for the death of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 tells us that Jesus Christ died for every person on the face of the earth. And so when we are talking about this glorious day, Resurrection Sunday, we need to take into consideration that Jesus Christ died for every one of us in this sanctuary and everyone who has lived, does live, or, or ever will live. He died for the sins of the whole world. That's a part of the message of the resurrection of Easter time, as it is called. Secondly, we take a look at the burial of Christ. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 4 again, it says, and that, he wrote, and that he was buried. That he was buried. And as I said a few minutes ago, so often we don't talk about the burial of Jesus Christ. Many times it's overlooked. But it is a part of the gospel, is it not? It is a part of that nutshell in which the gospel sits, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it must not therefore be forgotten if it's included in the word of God. If the burial of Christ is emphasized, we must emphasize it in our thinking of the gospel. In fact, as we study the scripture, we find that the word of God says a lot about it. Turn with me, if you would please, to John chapter 19, the gospel of John chapter 19. One of the passages of Scripture that speaks concerning the burial of our Savior. John chapter 19, in verse 38. Notice what it says. It says that after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. That is, he let him do it. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night. Remember that in John 3? And brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. That's about 65 pounds. So what we see in verses 38 and 39 are the people of the burial. Joseph of Arimathea, a town probably 30, 35 miles from Jerusalem, and Nicodemus. You know the significant thing about these two fellows? They were both members of the Jewish Sanhedrin. The Jewish Sanhedrin was the Jewish Supreme Court that decided all of the laws of the land. They were a part of that religious leader group. We know for sure that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. They were the ones who, who probably followed Jesus at a distance. We know that Nicodemus came to Jesus Christ by night, but both of them were Jewish people for whom Christ came into the world first of all to die for. They were the people, as it were, of the burial of Christ. And it's interesting here that it says that that Nicodemus brought myrrh and aloes. These were ba basically spices. Remember, back in those days, they did not inject embalming fluid into the body of a person who was, death, who was dead, but they would put these spices over the body so as to stymie, as it were, the smell of the deterioration of the body. And that's what Nicodemus was doing, and that's what the ladies were doing when they were coming to the body on the first day of the week that we read about earlier today in the opening part of our service. So the people of the burial were two Jews, Joseph and Nicodemus. Then we see the process of the burial. Verse 40 says, They took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with spices as a matter of the Jews is to bury. In other words, the process of the burial was according to Jewish custom. They would take that body, they would put these spices on the body, 
At times, many times, they would even put the 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 the, the wrapping of those uh, of, the, of the body in those spices, and they would wrap that body, and then they would put the the spices over the body again in order to to take away the smell of the deterioration. That was the process according to Jewish custom. And obviously Nicodemus and and, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, who were Jews, did it that way. But then we see the place of the burial. Verses 41 and 42. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because the Jews' preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. I've been over to the Middle East, and if you've never been there, I would encourage you to go sometime. If we were to stand and look at this area, if we were to look at it in front of us at the right would be the place of the skull upon which Jesus died, Calvary. In front of the place of the skull is a bus station. But if you were to walk from the place of the skull toward the left, you would come into a beautiful garden in which is a tomb, a sepulcher, that was never used. You know, that, that's significant, I think. That's why the Bible put it in there. Because there was never a body that had deteriorated in that sepulcher. You understand that? Neither, of course, did Jesus's because he rose again the third day. But when you walk in that tomb, he's not there. He's risen. Amen. Amen. But not only as we look at the burial of Christ, we see the people of the burial and the process of the burial and the place of the burial. But what's the purpose of the burial? Why why does the Bible emphasize the burial? Simply because it's the proof of his death. There were all sorts of people who came up with all sorts of stories as to what happened to Jesus. Where did he go? Well, many of them denied the fact that he really died. But you see, according to Jewish custom, he had to be in the grave three days and three nights to prove that he was dead. Jesus Christ was in there long enough to prove that he was dead. And on the third day, he rose again triumphantly. Up from the grave, he arose. He died for us. He was buried, proving his death. But then we come to the glorious resurrection of Christ. We go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to to the scriptures. I submit to you today that which every true preacher of the gospel has taught down through the history of time and that every true pulpit in the world today will preach and that is this that the distinctive element of Christianity is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without the resurrection of Christ, Christianity would be just another empty religion, but he is alive. Amen. And that's the difference between Religion and Christianity. And, 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 yeah, and Christianity. Religion is dead. You'll go into some churches today, and that service will be as dead as a rotten doornail on a door that's 300 years old. It's a dead doornail. But you go into a church where they preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's a living service because Jesus is alive. The distinctive element of Christianity is the resurrection of Christ. Without the resurrection of Christ, Christianity is just another empty religion, but it is a live relationship. Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship with Christ. And how we thank the Lord for the fact that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That was a part of Peter's great message, was it not? Praise the Lord. 
Let's look at the purpose of Christ's resurrection. Why did Christ come out of the grave? Well, number one, to provide the fulfillment of the scriptures. Even as we mentioned earlier, there were many prophecies given concerning the death of Christ. There were also prophecies given concerning the resurrection of Christ. Isaiah 53 again uh, is a passage that speaks of his death and his resurrection. And his burial too, by the way. And Matthew 16, as we studied, uh, looked at a little bit ago, speaks of his resurrection. And so you see, the purpose of Christ's resurrection was to fulfill the scriptures. It says here that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's what the scriptures said. That's what Jesus did. But the other purpose of the resurrection was to provide the reality of eternal life. Because he lives, so shall we live too. The Bible says the thief, devil, the devil comes not but for to steal and kill and destroy. But Christ said, I am come that they not have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Life that's worth living. Life that's eternal. Life that goes on forever in the presence of God is why Jesus Christ came out of that grave. And he did it for you and he did it for me. And so the purpose of Christ's resurrection was to provide the fulfillment of the scriptures and to provide the reality of eternal life. But what about the power of Christ's resurrection? Very powerful. Let's go back once again to the book of Acts in chapter 2. Acts, the second chapter, where we find again Peter's great message. He said there in verse 21, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, and we read down through there just a little bit ago, if you recall. But notice verse 23 and 24. Him Christ being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken by wicked, dirty hands, have crucified and slain, whom, what are those next three words? God hath raised. God raised him up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. <laughs> you can't keep God in a grave. You can't keep God in a grave. You cannot keep God in a grave. It was impossible for the grave to hold our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so when we talk about the power of Christ's resurrection, we realize it was extended from the omnipotence of God. God is the all-powerful one. But it was also extended to defeat Satan. Mm. We read this passage of Scripture this morning back in prayer meeting, and you're all invited to our 9 o'clock prayer meeting before church on Sunday mornings. Over in the book of Colossians, we see an interesting statement in Colossians chapter 2, where it speaks concerning the work of Christ. Verse 14 says, Blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers. Those are demonic powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Listen, when Jesus Christ was in that grave, all the power of Satan and his minions and demons were there to keep him there. Yeah. But when it came time for the resurrection, no trouble at all. Jesus Christ came forth triumphantly, just like you and I would dust the dust off of our suit, shirt, blouse, whatever we have. That's not hard at all, is it? Up from the grave he arose at the right time through the power of Almighty God. Satan couldn't keep him there. He is alive. He is risen. He is risen Amen. The purpose of Christ's resurrection, the power of Christ's resurrection. What about the proof of Christ's resurrection? Can we prove it? Oh, yes. There, there, there were many eyewitnesses. In the book of Acts chapter 1, it says that he taught, Christ Jesus taught after his resurrection. And not only did he teach, but there were many infallible proofs of his resurrection. We see that in, in Acts, as it were, chapter 1 and verse 3. You've heard that verse many times over again. Where it says, to whom Christ showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible, infallible proofs. That means proofs that cannot be denied. 
It goes on to say, being seen to them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. There were eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Christ. We see that as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We've already read about them. It says, beginning with verse uh, 5, he was seen of Peter, Cephas, that's Peter, then of the 12, that's the rest of the disciples. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. And by the way, if 500 brethren were together, what else were probably there? A few cisterns. And their kids. Could have been 1,500 people there or more at once. It was no dream. It was no vision. It was true. He says, as Paul wrote there in 1 Corinthians 15, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep, some have died. That's in Paul's day. Then he says, after that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me, Paul says, also as of one born out of due time. Listen, there is eyewitness proof of his resurrection but there is also historical proof of his resurrection. I was just reading this week in some apologetic books about the resurrection of Christ. Josephus, who was a Jewish historian who lived from about 37 A.D. to about 100 A.D. in his Antiquities of the Jews, said about this time lived Jesus, a wise man of deed, one ought to call him a man. He was a teacher of extraordinary deeds and was a teacher of those who accept the truth gladly. Here's a Jewish man writing. He says he was won over by many Jews and many Greeks. He was the Messiah. And when he was indicted by the principal men among us and Pilate condemned him to be crucified, those who came to love him originally did not cease to do so, for he appeared to them the third day. He appeared, definite fact, to them the third day, restored to life. As the prophets of, of God had foretold these and countless other marvelous things about him. And the tribe of Christians so named after him has not disappeared to this day. And by the way, we are still here. We are still here. We are still here. Because we have a resurrected Lord. Proof through eyewitnesses. Proof through historic evidence. Proof through changed lives. You remember these, these disciples, once Christ was taken and crucified, they ran away and hid. They were afraid. But when they saw him alive, their lives were changed. Colossians 1 says they preached the gospel throughout the whole world. They became powerful preachers. In fact, I'll put it this way. Their lives were changed from, faithful, from fearful wanderers to powerful proclaimers of Christ. They wouldn't have been willing to die for somebody who was dead and didn't come out of the grave, now would they? But he did die. He did come out of the grave. He is alive. It changed their lives. And they were willing to speak for him. They were preachers for Christ. They were persecuted for Christ. But then not only do we see the proof of changed lives in the first century, but we have, even today, we see how Jesus Christ changes lives. Amen? How many of you have had an alcoholic background? You came to Christ, your life was changed, right? How many of you had a background in drugs? You came to Christ and you gave up the drugs, right? How many of you were, were scoundrels and thieves and robbers? and Anybody else want to volunteer anything else? <laughs> but you came to Christ and your life changed, didn't it? That's what Jesus does. The proof of Christ's resurrection, eyewitnesses, historical evidence, changed lives. As well as a continuing church. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. When Jesus was in that grave, all of hell was upon him to keep him there. But he arose triumphantly and his church will live eternally in his presence. Hallelujah, we have a risen Savior. His name is Jesus. The purpose of Christ's resurrection, the power of Christ's resurrection, the proof of Christ's resurrection, the prospect of Christ's resurrection. Hmm. 1 Corinthians 15 teaches us that because Christ has risen, so shall we also rise. 
Because Christ has life, so we who believe in him have eternal life. And because of the resurrection of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28, clearly teaches us that all of the enemies of Christ will eventually be defeated. He's alive. He is risen. And there's no doubt about it. The death of Christ died for us, paying the wage of sin. The burial of Christ, the proof that he did die. The resurrection of Christ, he is alive. And because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, only he can save. Because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, only he should be worshipped. Because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, only he should be served. And because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, only he provides eternal life and victory over sin. And we all say to God be the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, you didn't hear it. We should say to God be the glory, great things he hath done. Has he given you life? Have you received him as your savior? If this message of the resurrection doesn't mean much to you, it probably means that you've never trusted Christ as Savior. And on this Resurrection Sunday 2018, I would encourage you to do it. Call upon the name of the Lord and ask Him to save you. Respond accordingly to the resurrection of Christ by trusting Him. And then serve Him. Live for Him and share Him. Hallelujah, what a Savior. He's risen. He's risen. He's risen. He is risen. He is risen and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to look into your word today to talk about the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Take this message and drive it home to our hearts by your Spirit. And Lord, if there's anybody today who does not know Christ under the sound of my voice, my prayer is they'll come to know him in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 140, He Lives, He Lives, He Lives, He Lives. And we need to sing about it. You ask me how I know He lives, He lives within my heart. But there are many other evidences. Number 140, let's sing this song gloriously to the Lord. at www.fbcaltuna.org or write to The Faith Baptist Church, 31540 Street, Altoona, Pennsylvania, 16602, USA. I'm JT Teeter. Till the next time we meet, may the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.